Hi, everybody. I'm so delighted to do our here tonight. Um, on behalf of the Elizabeth A. Sackler um, Feminist um, Art, um, it's a pleasure to have you all here. I'm one of the council members. I'm Marjorie Marte. I'm also um, founder of Art W, which promotes women artists um, through creation, education, and um, advocacy. So tonight, we are delighted to have Intimate Transgressions, Act of Doing. And we've had an amazing um, show at the White Box Gallery with um, the curator Juan Puntes, as well as Rello Samundo, and Fionn Gunn, who is here from London, who's been the curator. Um, the moderation tonight is by Anita Glesta, who is somebody I've known for a long time, who recently just came back, by the way, from London and has done a great show, um, part of uh, the Thames Festival called Watershed. And um, it was a big success in London, so we're very happy about that. Um, we also have on the panel um, Eleanor Hartney, who is a writer for Art in America. We have Louisa Valenzuela, who just flew in from Buenos Aires. Um, we have Sharon Nishat, a wonderful photographer. Um, and we have um, um, all the other people, well, Fionn, who is also an artist as well in this. What we're going to see behind myself is a loop of all the artwork that was at the incredible show, which, by the way, will still be on this weekend, so you can see it. And tomorrow, there will be two shows that you can see. What tonight is all about is the discussion of what art's role is in raising awareness of war, genocide, rape, and sexual violence, as well as the ways that art is used that, as a tool for transformation in the face of conflicts and human rights. I just also want to thank Jessica Wilcox for helping me tonight to make this happen. Uh, Rebecca Taffel, without her help, it would not be here. And Elizabeth Sackler, who believes in this kind of programming. Unfortunately, she had a conflict, but she called to tell me that these are the kinds of programs that the Sackler Center should be doing. So I'm going to turn this over. Oh, and the other thing I want to say is this particular program is organized by COPPA, which is the Center for Asian Pacific Affairs, and the White Box. Um, so we are here tonight to celebrate that, as well as the wonderful panelists. So I'm going to turn it over to both Vian and Anita Glesta. Thank you. So thank you, Marjorie, for, for who you are and for the wonderful work that you're doing on behalf of women artists and for extending yourself to make this possible for White Box and for the show and for everyone's opportunity to speak a little bit from our respective disciplines about this issue. And um, I'm not going to say too much right now because I'll have quite a few questions to ask after. But I will talk a little bit about how we're going to be structured, which is conversational. And we will not run on, however. It doesn't mean that it's going to be never-ending conversation. <laughs> so we will put some limits to that. Um, we will probably be about an hour, and then our respondents, who will be Juan Puntes and Raul Samurio, will uh, ask questions of the panel, and then we will open this up to, to you all. So that's how we are going. And um, without further ado, Fionn, you can introduce everybody. Thank you, and, and welcome to everybody. Thanks again to Marjorie, thanks to the Sackler Center. And I would have to say a huge thanks to Kappa, which is the sponsor for this exhibition, which wouldn't have happened without them. And it's been done with the best humanitarian intentions. Um, I would like to introduce Eleanor Hartney, the art critic, um, who is going to be the first person I will ask a question to. And we've got to share a mic as well. So I just wanted to ask Eleanor, you've spoken about how art has opened up windows for you, windows into science, technology, philosophy. Uh, and I'd like to know what you feel about art opening up windows into moral issues and ethical issues, and if you think that's an effective way, uh, an effective way to move forward. Um, yes, of course. Um, I think that art 
nothing human is foreign to art. Um, and I think that art is actually a very effective way of bringing up moral and political dilemmas. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I, it's interesting because we sort of had a little conversation before all this, and I've been thinking about sort of this question of efficacy of art and what can art do, what can art be. And on the one hand, um, you know, the question is always asked of political art, will it affect change? And, you know, I think it's very difficult to say whether art can affect change. And on the one hand, I'm, I'm very, um, you know, political art is something that's very dear to my heart. But on the other hand, I feel like insisting on a kind of instrumental definition of art in that way is a problem and is dangerous. You know, it's almost as bad as the kind of mercantile definition of art, which is the other side of the coin right now, you know, where art is of value because it does well in the market. To, to, to insist that art, to narrow it down, I guess, to a instrumental, um, you know, purpose, I think it, it narrows what art can be because part of what I think has always attracted me to art is, you know, kind of the open-endedness of it and the way that it, it does pose questions. And yes, it absolutely brings up ethical dilemmas, but it doesn't necessarily tell us what we're supposed to think. And I think that's the value of art. Thank you for that, and yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Luisa Valenzuela, a writer, uh, who is currently living in Argentina, but lived in New York for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about how you feel that art can contribute to, to the particular message of this exhibition. To, d is there a role, and how, how do you as a writer feel about passing on that that information. Yeah. What I was thinking when this uh, situation was presented to me is that finally one of the big definitions of art is that it makes visible the invisible. And our situation, our Argentine situation, and thinking from my own uh, experience in my country, we, we invented of sorts that terrible figure of the disappeared. The Argentine military during the dictatorship decided that those people that were killed by them or tortured or dis really disappeared wouldn't exist at all, wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, they would be forgotten forever. So one of the missions of art, it's, it, and many, the mothers of Plaza de Mayo, who were the first ones to really protest on that, brought that situation into the picture because it was one way to let these people live forever. Uh, there were many, many uh, experiments and many, many um, things done around that. For example, the white masks. Um, at some point, already the dictatorship was over, but uh, when they were celebrating the 400 and something marches of the Thursdays, every Thursday the mothers would march with a, oh yeah, this is a very iconic image of mothers with the white kerchiefs on the head which were actually the nappies, the idea that the only thing they had were the nappies, and then they put the name of their, their sons and daughters who had been uh, disappeared. Uh, at some point, uh, right after the, uh, not before even the dictatorship was over, but when the already the, the situation was getting a little more um, easy flowing and things were sort of changing, they did something that was called the siluetazo. So the artist came over and um, suggested they should uh, paint to do the silhouettes, empty silhouettes. And so they would lie down on the floor on white papers and white, white wrapping paper and do the silhouettes. So this whole city, mainly the Avenida Major where the marshals were, were covered by the silhouettes of the disappeared. So that was an art manifestation that was very striking for us. And then in another one of these marches, they um, gave away white masks. And people that were marching, there were, they, they, already there were thousands of people marching. On, on, the, on the special dates, um, would march with white masks. And what I learned lately is that in Milano, uh, by the Scala, by the, the, the piazza that's in front of the Scala, uh, they're putting a, a red cloth and white masks, remembering the mothers of Plaza Masha because of immigrants that are disappeared. So this is, and many, there are many more contributions of art into the sense of bringing back to life those that were tortured and were dead in the, in the moment. So I think it's, a, it's, it's an important dialogue. 
And it's that moment when that that cannot be said is said through another manner. And it's much more, uh, the, the impact is stronger than just a simple protest. Yes, and it, it's, it's interesting that you talk about that, about the, 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 the strength of the image. Um, Anita and I were speaking earlier today and we were talking about um, exactly the danger of, of being reductive and, and where you've got art reduced to either the commercial or something that becomes just about message. And Anita, you said some, I think, quite interesting things about the danger of, of, of art becoming reduced in that way. Well, I think the question that you were asking me, which I have written here, was <laughs> specifically, can visual art have a political message? And I think that I responded to the question about the word message, first of all. And um, which I think is tricky. And the other is that it is complex to think about a visual image, a two-dimensional image, for example, a poster, as being um, totally effective. And the reason that I question that and question message as well is that it can as often be used as propaganda. And it has been historically. And so one of the things that I just found very compelling about what you said that was so moving about art was how it was manifested physically and viscerally in the street as, as a performance rather than something that is slapped on a wall or, or even you know in a gallery that has images of people shooting. We're not in the 18th century and it's not Goya anymore. You know, we have a very, very different relationship to what the role of art is. And so I think it is much more nuanced than, um, than a message and then a visual image. That's, that's my yeah. response And, and again, I mean, I, I think one of the ambitions with this exhibition was, yes, there is a message, but the artworks themselves are complex and very multi-layered pieces of work which approach the situation and the issues from all different angles um, and hopefully keep the sense of poetry in what artists produce. So the curation may be on message, but actually the artworks are far more subtle than that. And, and so we'd come to, to Shirin. Um, to ask you, um, and, and Anita is going to pose the question about your practice and what you do. So I was going to ask you about the fact that your work explores issues of patriotism and courage and love and devotion, but at the same time, it also addresses betrayal and cruelty and suffering. And um, I'm just wondering how you are able to integrate this and move the global discourse forward through your work in this context? Well, it's difficult for me to answer that question before saying that um, I think my work is obviously very much inspired by reality, the sociopolitical reality of my country, Iran, and, and the personal uh, aspects of my life as as a person who has been abroad looking in a country that has gone through all kinds of upheavals from revolutions, etc., So my work has been a fiction relating to reality that although I was not experiencing directly um, uh, and only witnessed it from a distance, it has huge impact on my life. Um, but yet my expression is very much metaphoric, it's poetic. So it's very difficult for me to, um, to really take that role of someone who's an expert or an activist or who, who can speak with that kind of authority because I think my reaction to political reality has been no different than a poet and it's very emotional. And not to say that it's not informed, and intelligent, but uh, I, I want to say that. So, for example, what you're speaking about in this notion of patriotism has been a subject of my work because with the woman of Allah, uh, it was the subject of women who were voluntarily uh, martyrs and militants uh, in their devotion to religion. And, and then yet in the Green Movement, 
there was a new form of activism, particularly among women as much as men, who who, who now um, were strongly con had the strong conviction for democracy, and and yet in both um, instances there was a direct interface with violence and atrocity and death. So for me that became a major, um, mostly philosophical and emotional question that I created for myself, that how could this act of love of God or love of nation, uh, sacrifice, uh, devotion be so often intersected, um, intersecting with atrocity and cruelty and and hate, which whether it comes from the Islamic Revolution or from the Green Movement. So I have created a whole series, The Book of Kings, that really sort of showed simple body gestures, the, the touch of heart, the, the, the pledge of honor that is universal, with yet the feeling of terror and, and um, et cetera. So um, I guess what I'm saying is that my work keeps returning the questions that relate very specifically to the Iranian culture and that how historically Iranian people have gone through this circle of um, you know, re re revolutions, revolt, and yet um, repression and atrocity and yeah, oppression. And then many years later, this occurs. So, no, if I answered your question. Um, actually, I think that the way that you answer that is to point to this strange and crazy paradox of being human that might at, at be Iranian, but is also particularly this incredibly strange dialectic of the thin line between good and evil. And that's what you distill poetically in your work. It also comes back to the issue of what happens at time of social revolution generally. Um, and, and that also is something that there's a lot of crossover between what happens at, in times of conflict and the upsurge of, of war and genocide rape, for example, um, that the extremities are reached. Um, and I know that, I think you were going to ask me something, were you, Anita? No? No, no, no. no. Um, yes, I think you were going to ask me about links between objectification and commodification. Um, and okay, I'm going to ask you that. Will uh, you okay. answer that I, now? I'm really sorry about this. We're, we're obviously, go, as you can go, see, we're, go ahead um, and answer. We're, we're terribly inefficient as a, as a double act. But um, we, were t we were talking about this uh, the other day. The difficulties where... Um, if, you, if you think about what happens to victims of sexual violence generally, there is that making of them a thing. They become things to the people who are abusing them and who are violating them. They are, they are as nothing. They are not human. Um, and we were drawing strange parallels with, with, with actually the, how art can objectify as well. And the... Um, historically, the idealization of, of things that are beautiful, idealization of women, idealization of beautiful children, young boys, it doesn't have to be just women. Um, it's not actually that gender specific. And, and the thrust of that is the, you know, the flip side to that idealization, which goes back to what you were talking about, the flip side of patriotism and love and, and all those things, is the destruction. You take a person, you take them and you treat them as a thing and you destroy them. It seems to be the flip side of that idealization that happens in art. And, and so I'd like to bring it back to Eleanor again. And I have to check what I'm supposed to ask. Um, but actually, this comes back to what you wrote about the incredible shrinking art critic. And uh, there is a link, really, um, because you were outlining your concerns about delivery systems. And I think that many artists who are working in the non-commercial area for, you know, we're making art about meaning and sometimes art that has an element of protest that's raising issues of social justice. But if, if the art world is very commercial, then obviously that work will never be sold 
and how do you survive as an artist? Do you go and stack shelves in a supermarket in order to make art that is meaningful? That isn't something that necessarily you want to hang up in, in a dining room in, in, in sort of a, a middle class suburb. So I think there are kind of parallels with our experiences there. And, and I'd like you to sort of to tell us a little bit about your concerns about art criticism in this area. Well, you know, I, I mean, I, I think in many ways there are, I always I, I was like to think that there are a lot of parallel art universes. There's not just one art universe. But the problem is that, the, you know, there is one art universe that seems to get more attention than the other art universes. And a lot of that, and, and that's particularly the case now. I mean, and this is part of what I was talking about in the article, um, that, you know, that at, at a time when there is so much, you know, kind of money at the top, when there's so much concern about, you know, art as investment, et cetera, et cetera, you know, when the art magazines are all being um, purchased by collectors and, and uh, auction houses, and, you know, all of these things begin to, you know, make you think that there, there's only this one art world, which is the art world of, like, the hundred top artists, or, you know, all, all these lists that they're always, like, putting out there. And, you know, it, it's, I think it's difficult for artists, it's difficult for critics also, because, you know, it's really not very interesting as a critic to be, you know, just kind of making lists. Um, so there are these parallel art universes where, and these are the ones that are more interesting to me. There's, for example, I, I, one of the issues actually that came up for me in just the discussion we've just had is the, the difference between kind of public art and non, I guess we, I don't know what to call it, non-public art. But you know, public art is a, is a place where there's a certain um, kind of, of um, certain kinds of things are possible, certain kinds of things are not possible. What Louisa was talking about, there's a certain kind of directness that's possible there. On the other hand, in the kind of work that Sharin's talking about, which is not necessarily out there on the public street, but is very thoughtful and, and is, is very, very poetic and, and and metaphoric and that you know brings us to an understanding of things um, through metaphor which is something that art and literature you know, have always done I mean that that's another universe in a way so there's these different universes that the, the real problem is is it's not that people aren't doing this kind of work and people are doing this kind of non-commercial work but the problem really is that right now the delivery systems as I was talking about in this article you know seem to be so honed and focused you know, towards this, you know, very high-end commercial part. And, you know, I mean, I think, you know, I, I just kind of sit here thinking, well, wouldn't it be nice if the art market would crash? But, um, you know, we can sort of get back to, you know, kind of what it really ought to be about. But, you know, we, instead we sort of have to exist within these different art universes. I do, and uh, could I just quickly go back to Louisa here? Because it was very, I mean, talking about this in the, the sort of honed commercial nature of the art world, and yet to hear you describe the interventions, the public interventions by the, by the mothers of the Plata de Mayo. Uh, actually, what we go back to is the, the huge importance of the physicality of the object, actually, that... You know, you can read your thousand words, you can look at, 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 at slick digit, digital images, but to have the physical material um, art in front of you has an impact that maybe other forms don't. Well, uh, literature doesn't in a sense, but then theater does. So um, we can move from one side of the situation to the other. Um, I kept thinking because of this um, proposition here about women being uh, tortured or women being mistreated or women being disappeared and uh, so on and so forth. Not only of this uh, public art or supposedly art, it might not be perfect art, but this is this way of putting um, the situation in the front through metaphors. So this is finally what art does. So I, I, I go back again to this time of censorship and difficulty in Argentina, and we had what was called Teatro Abierto. The theater did a lot of good work. And um, the, the theater people decided they couldn't do things against the dictatorship, 
in a very elaborate way. So they had this read and they, made, they wrote very short pieces to be read in a, in a small theater that was called Picadero, and the theater was burned the next week. And they only could do it for a week and it was burned. So the whole, the whole theater business of Buenos Aires offered their the venues for this to go on. So it, it, it went on in a very, very um, uh, popular, in uh, now uh, 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 Broadway, which is a Calle Corriente. So this was helpful. There. And this is a way to make people conscious of what is going on. I am against the idea of the message as such. Because if you're really doing art, you cannot think of a message. But the immediacy of the need to respond to those terrible situations, then this concept of message or non-message uh, evaporates of sorts. So you really have to act in that way. And uh, one thing, one important thing that happened also with theater in, in Argentina is that one of the mothers of Plaza de Mayo already during the, in the year 2000, wrote a piece about a disappeared son and, and, and those people that didn't know his identity. There were 500 children born in captivity that were uh, taken away and given to foster parents, mainly many of the torturers. So they didn't know who they were. And the people who lost their, their grandmothers couldn't know about their grandchildren. So they started looking for, and with that play, the one, one appeared and recognized itself. So they started a movement that every Monday in the month of August, every theater in Buenos Aires, and there are many, many, because there are really small theater playing all the time, had to give a play with this subject. So generally, the actors would sit, um, stand up at the beginning and say, well, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so, I'm so-and-so. They said, we know who we are, but there are 500 people here who don't know who they really are. So this is what we are going to give this play for. And now, the, the, there are 175 who appeared along this the last 30 years, and they keep on appearing. So uh, this is something that the, not necessarily only the theater did, but the theater helped a lot. And the writing of the literature is strange, the situation of literature is strange, because we thought there would be so many manuscripts hidden before, during the dictatorship, and there were not that many. And, and my own experience, and I'll be short with this, is that I did write a very strong uh, short story that was meant to be a novel, uh, with a starting point, a different, uh, it would start before the situation of the short story was told, and it would go on after that situation which I never could go on with, it was too, too hard. And I couldn't even, when I finished it during the heart of the dictatorship, I couldn't even show it to my best friends because I had the feeling that that would put them into danger, that knowledge of something which I thought it was even exaggerated from my point of view. And then I can tell you more about that. And then we learned through the, through the trials that what I was thinking was happening was actually happening and even worse. And, uh, but then it is more, the literature situation is more secluded than the visual part and, and the, the street art or whatever can be done in a very immediate way uh, without, without uh, recognition. So I was never thinking about commercial art when this uh, subject matter popped up because it's really not necessarily, then it can be very moving, then it can become commercial, but uh, the, the intention is elsewhere. The intention is really to, again, to, to speak about what cannot be said, no? to put in, in, in scene or to, or to paint or to do whatever you can do with art, uh, as to uh, be conscious and don't, not, not to forget you know, the, the memory situation, the idea of memory. No? And then I can tell you more of what happens with women and all that in, in uh, South America and in, in Latin America. So I'm going to segue thank you about women now and ask Shirin um, a, a question about going back to women, which is that um, the revolution uh, is, always affects women. And I'm wondering how, in particular, what you feel about how women in the Middle East are being treated and... Um, whether you can speak about that as an artist? And well, I keep um, wanting to speak more abstractly about things as I told you I'm a woman of it's fiction. Fine. It's fine <laughs> if you do, to. by the way. I mean, I was just thinking in response to what was being yeah. said, 
that for me, because there was the question of where does the art comes from, and I think art grows out of an obsession of the artist, and very often it's, this obsession grows uh, as in, in relation to their personal history and, and, and personal angst, and, and existential as well as political, um, cultural, sexual issues. And then the artist has to formulate it so it becomes a form of communication that is no longer about just the artist, but the world they inhabit and the issues of humanity that others share. So in some ways for me, it's impossible to talk about Iranian revolution without thinking about myself, like where do I fit in because I'm not a sociologist, I'm not an expert of any kind of political activist. Um, so I can only look at revolution in, in that point of where do I fit in? How do I see other women um, uh, participating in a revolution? But to be very practical about your question, um, I mean, I think that um, in one of the things that I've, I think subconsciously I've captured in my work is the changes by the study of the woman in Iran. I could speak about Iran, not entire Middle East. You can go about a study of the country. Uh, and, and how, indeed, every revolution, every change of the country, it's read through the lives of the women. Uh, if the Islamic Revolution came, it forced the woman to wear the veil, and it completely transformed their private and public lives, where during the Shah's um, time, women actually were forced to take down the veil, and, and they lived a very modern life. And now, since uh, the early years of the revolution, you see a new generation of women that are highly educated and are not um, um, abiding to the rules. And that was very evident in the Green Movement, uh, where you see um, that uh, the women today are not my generation or my mother's generation because they're highly educated and, and they are very aware of the world. And therefore, um, they're very mobilized, very vocal. A majority of them are working. They're not just mothers at home. So this is a new form of feminism, in my opinion, where they're still you know, Islamic in some ways, and they still um, believe in separation of sexes, but they're very, very active uh, members of the society, where in my generation, maybe 30% of the women were educated and active, and in my mother's um, generation, mm, very few women did. So, just to answer your question on a practical level, I think it is very interesting how the political changes, the regime, brings in really a definite change in the women's lives. And I think that's sort of following on from what you've said, do you feel that you've got a particular role to play as an artist and as an Iranian woman artist? Do you have a particular role in your wider society to play? No, I, I, don't, I hope not. Um, as too much of a responsibility, um, I think um, um, there is, at times, uh, I think in the Iranian culture, where there is the artist and then there is the work. And sometimes the artist is pulled in the public arena um, and has, has to be vocal, like in my part. I, I was very outspoken and during tough periods in Iranian history in the Green Movement. I, I was very vocal against uh, the government and pro-democracy um, movement, um, but I never tried to directly inflict that on my work. So because I think that's really wrong and I don't want to be a vehicle of a propaganda. Uh, and so I think I have a different relationship to my country where they're seeing me as a public person and they see my work as something that I think it's far more mysterious, I hope, uh, and is not overtly uh, being biased about. I'm not in a position to dictate what is wrong and what is right and what, who is good and who is bad but I can speak about tyranny, and I, and I could question people of power, but I'm not going to create work that makes the decision for the people. But when I'm vocal publicly, uh, I, I could take that liberty and, and really speak the truth. 
It's, uh, yes, and actually what you're doing is you're making the divi division between art and politics very clearly as well. I hope so. Yeah, because actually, if you want to do politics, be a politician. Yeah. However, the artist message, which is, you know, I think you can see we're all more or less on the same page in terms of the complexity and what you're doing as a human being. And you've brought up very interestingly the fact that what you do as an artist is reflecting your own personal engagement with your own life, your own the stuff that's happened to you. And that becomes emblematic of the sort of culture that you come from, um, wherever you may be in the world. And um, uh, it also brings up the issue of artistic and aesthetic quality. And I think you've partly answered that, actually, very clearly. But I wanted to pass that over to Anita as well, that if you are making work that is engaging with meaning and protest and exploration of very difficult issues, how do you go about doing that as an artist and not, sa not sacrifice the artistic quality of what you are making? Um, well, I'm going to answer that directly, and then I actually want to go back to the two universes, because I think there's something happening here with actually an urgency in these two particular cultures from which you both are, where separate universes are not as clearly about commercial and political because it lacks the urgency of of that, and I, and I really think that's an important distinction. And then in terms of my own work, I can answer to uh, specifically actually the work in this show where I was asked to do a work by Juan about how women were used in uh, sexual slaves during World War II in the camps. And I um, thought hard about how to encapsulate that into as a way as a visual artist because a lot has been written about it, films have been done about it, but what really could have resonance for me to en encapsulate that? And so I, I did a lot of reading of archival material about what happened during that time and felt that the best way in which I could address this was to create an installation where I focused on a, a particular story, or an apocryphal story that had many different versions, but they were all similar, which was about a woman who was online for the camps, for Auschwitz, and she was very beautiful, and she was a dancer, and of course the Nazis didn't believe in having sex with Jewish women or the Roma women because they were considered animals, but this particular woman was so beautiful that the Gestapo officer couldn't resist her and pulled her out of the line. And she decided to do a striptease and in so doing was able to take the pistols from both the, this Schillinger, the name of the officer, and another guy who he was with, another Gestapo officer, and she shot them dead and then she was shot. And I was very interested in this story because it was both about her empowerment for a moment as a woman and then of course her disempowerment. And the only way I could think that I could really begin to talk about what happened there, not as a filmmaker or a writer, was to somehow use that story uh, as, as a metaphor um, for, for this work. And, and I'm speaking to this because I, I don't think that it's as much an aesthetic decision as part of a larger whole, which is how you conceptually understand a, a situation and then how it's distilled as a, as a work of visual or performative or interactive art. And I, and I do the same thing when I work in the public and hopefully I believe that people can rise to the occasion if it is nuanced, and, and, and I think that that's happening more and more, but I think that what is unfortunate is in our world, in this, in this country, in this Western universe, there really are two worlds. There is the very commercial, terrible one that's kind of take, eating the rest of the world, and then there are those who really are, are um, 
concerned with history and memory and with current social situation. So that's how I'm answering that. Is it my turn to ask another question? Well, well, I, uh, well the next bit is about you know art and transformation and all the rest of it. So yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, and I'm throwing this open to all of the panelists. Um, if art is going to be an agent for transformation, and in, I mean this in the widest possible sense. I don't mean it in a narrow political sense. I mean transformation on ev every level. How can it be a trans how can it be a transformative agent if it's always going to be in galleries? And what do you do about that? Well, yeah, I guess this kind of goes back to that the public art versus non-public art kind of division that I was talking about. Um, and I think, well, obviously there's public art, and so public art is out there in the world and talks to non-art people, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's more politically effective, I think, than art in galleries. I mean, we, you know, we talk about, we, you know, as if the galleries are some kind of sort of separate world cut off, you know, and have nothing to do with the other world. But if, if what you're talking about is sort of, is transformation of, and changing people's minds and making people think differently, you know, you, you don't really know. You put a work out there, you don't really know, you know, how it's going to touch someone, how it's going to, you know, open them up to something. I mean, and, and that those those kind of epiphanies can happen. They can happen in public art, but they can happen also, and they do happen, you know, in the these kind of more private spaces as well. So in, in certain ways, you know, this I, I think, you know, the the whole notion, well, it's just preaching to the converted. Um, well, you know, you're you you don't know who you're preaching to, actually. Um, and I think you know, I mean, I think it's good to show in a kind of a wide variety of spaces. I mean, we have, you know, big museums like this. We have alternative spaces like uh, White Box. I mean, there are different kinds of places also and where things can happen. Um, I think it's not likely to have transformative stuff happening in an art fair, but that's a whole other question. Um, but no, I mean, I I, th I think it, you know it it maybe it's too easy to just say well it's in a gallery it you know it doesn't you know it, it's it's sort of boxed off from the world what what effect can it have you don't know. Well, and that's a reasonable point, and actually it brings me to you, the audience. Could you no no not questions yet? Sorry, I just would like to have a show of hands. How many people here tonight? have a connection with the art world? Are you an artist, a gallerist? Are you connected with the art world? Would you mind putting your hands up, anybody who's connected with the art world? Well, I have a horrible feeling we may be preaching to the converted, and this is my concern, and this is my concern about art in galleries, because it's true that my transformative experiences with art happened largely within you know, very small provincial galleries in the middle of nowhere in Ireland a long time ago. But I would say that growing up, most of the people around me never went into those art galleries and never saw the stuff. This is the danger that, of course, the, the power of the artwork is there in the gallery, of course it is. But if the gallery ex itself is inaccessible for whatever reason, then we need to look at how to make these things more accessible. I was really hoping tonight that 50% of you would kind of say, well, actually, no, I have nothing to do with art. And I've just come here by chance, and great. But anyway, I, I think in a horrible way, that's sort of, ugh. Uh, yeah. yeah but, but people aren't just one thing. I mean, you know, people, yes, people are connected to the art world, but everybody here is connected to a lot of other worlds, too. So it, it, yeah, I mean, I, I understand the dilemma that you're talking about, but, I, you know, I, I think, I, yeah, I, I think it's too easy to just sort of dismiss, you know, the art audience as being, you know, kind of one that doesn't need to be addressed. Yeah. Oh, really, I'm, I'm not dismissing. It, it, it's not that, it's not that, it's just, I, I do quite a lot of work with socially excluded women, and I know that taking them to sort of galleries and spaces, there's an area of anxiety when they go there, and, um, and for many of them, their first experience of an art gallery would be maybe at 40, 50 years of age. And, um, and, and I'm, 
it, it's good that they get there, but but there are so many people who don't, you know. Um, and so I think on to you, Anita. Definitely. So I'm, I'm going to ask you, Luisa, if in Latin America there has been a change in how sexual violence is being addressed. Um, I was thinking about the situation that you are setting up here. And things propagate. I mean, the, uh, people go, a few people go to galleries or to museums, but the, the thing is like contagious, no? Um, generally, artists and writers respond to what's going on in the world. So there is this constant dialogue, even if we don't know about it. I do have that feeling. Um, uh, going back to the women uh, being uh, mistreated and, and badly treated and all that, um, there are many in Latin America, many women, or at least there's this femicide going on very intensively. We don't know exactly if now the count has been well done and people are counting really, or this is happening more intensely because women are being empowered. We have a woman president. I mean, women have power, so men feel more threatened, and they kill their spouses or, or their fiancés or whatever. Um, but then the reaction has been very interesting in many, in many towns. And in Mexico, for example, you have the Ciudad Juarez disappearances of these women, and there were many writers, many artists doing things. And, even if they, you don't know exactly what has been done, um, the, this whole reaction is intense. And in Argentina, on June the 3rd this year, we had this very, very big march of Nuna Menos, not one less, to protest. They're, they're killing one woman every day and a half. A woman has been murdered by the next of kin, generally. Uh, so this, this was very intense, and the movement was intense, and the artists were, of course, there. And uh, that's what drew more the attention, the, 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 the manifestation of the artists, what they would be doing in the street art, but also what they were doing in galleries or what they were doing in, in private. And at some point, there was this movement that I wanted to speak about today, the Bata, little Bata books. This little Bata books was born in, in Chile, and they called for a hundred women writers to write microfiction on the subject of the woman being killed, of the assassination of women. And then the, uh, Argentina did this vasta. A hundred writers wrote microfiction on the subject. Then Peru did, then Mexico did. So this is very contagious. So I, I invite the United States to do this also, the vasta. Enough. Enough women killed. Uh, so what we managed, and I think the art had a lot to do there, is to really have this uh, legal figure of femicide before there were crimes of passion. Mm. All these women being killed, oh, it was a crime of passion. He got jealous, he got desperate, and it was a crime of passion. Couldn't, it's not accountable for, not that much accountable. That's, the end, that's been ended also. Uh, and I think the, the art world <laughs> as such is it's, uh, it's, uh, permeable, no? It's, uh, how do you say it in English? It's, it's uh, leaking, I mean, it's, it's burnable. It's, no, they're not so mm, not close to situations. And, and, and big museums are open to the public and people are more or less being aware and more and more being aware of things which the artists call or the attention upon those subjects before anybody did. And then journalists will respond and, and this is an ongoing, this is a snowballing. Boring. Boring. Well, whatever. I'm um, sorry. Uh, so uh, it, it grows. So this is what we want to do, I suppose. Let this situation grow out of the galleries, out of everywhere, because there, are, there have to be responses by the journalists, by uh, the common public. You go out now and speak to your friends and tell about, and you go to jails and speak to the women in jail. And uh, God knows, I mean, this is an ongoing movement, no? All over the world, we need it. It is. Back to me. Um, so it, this was about the issue of art helping people to understand at all different levels what is going on. 
And as soon as you've been able to speak about it. Yes. Openly. As soon yes. as you've been able to speak about what is so hard to be said and to recognize and to acknowledge and to accept what is so hard to accept. Yes. And, and uh, I mean, in, in particular relationship to, in relation to the theme of the exhibition, that of sexual violence, carries with it a stigma that, for example, murder does not. I mean, oddly enough, um, it carries with it a stigma yes. that murder does not. And there's a situation in Guatemala, uh, one of the artists, oh, yes. Regina Jose Galindo, is, uh, is showing very, very interesting work at the exhibition. But there's a situation there where one of the townships set up um, a, a system whereby people could wear a paper flower um, to show that they had suffered during the conflict. And I can't remember exactly how it was. There was a red flower if, if, if you lost somebody. There was a purple flower if you were injured. Um, and, and you had your name, so the, all the victims were named. But the white flowers, which were for the victims of sexual violence, were without name. And for me, that's such a terrible thing because it's saying that those people who were victims are now doubly victims because they have to remain anonymous. Even though they did nothing wrong, they are not broken. The people who attacked them are the broken ones. Um, and I think there's that, what, what we would really like to do in the exhibition is to sort of to subvert that notion and say, you know, you do not have to be anonymous. You have done nothing. Absolutely, on the contrary. Yeah. yeah. And, and have the others who are in the same situation to speak up and be able to face us. And, and, uh, yes. Exactly. But now, now, this is happening. This is happening more and more. It is happening more and more. This is happening more and more. At least in my country, it's happening. Even they go to TV and they speak about the horrors. That's right. In that situation, yes. And it is hard, but... Um, it is also empowering. I mean, it's it also encouraging for others, and the people are grateful. And and in the in the context also of I mean, when what we've been talking about has has been focused, I suppose, generally on the notion of women being victims of sexual violence. But actually, a lot of men and boys are, and an awful lot of children are. Yeah. And this is yeah, what we we forget. Situation. I mean, absolutely, a, yes, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Um, would you like to add to that at all, Shirin? <laughs> so I'm going to then um, ask Fiona a little bit about w why you chose who you did in this show that you've curated. Well, firstly, the, when I was asked to curate it, um, the, the reason I came to it was because I'd been working for some years on, on, on the issue in my own work and was put in touch with the organizers by an artist I'd worked in, uh, worked with in another show about what happens to women at times of revolution. So my, the reason I was approached was because the sponsors in particular wanted to highlight the issue of the comfort women, which I don't know if, if many of you know about this situation, but the comfort women were basically sexual slaves during World War II, um, and they were victims of the Japanese military regime, which is, it's got its parallels with Nazism. And they, the Japanese military were doing exactly what the Nazis did in Europe, and they were doing it in Asia. And at the end of the war, just 25% of them had survived, and their health was broken. Um, to this day, there are, as people are getting older, of course, there are very few of them left. And, and one of the things they want is, they want sort of moral ju justice from, from the Japanese government. And, and I really want to make the division here between Japanese government and people, because it's not the same. But basically, they've been fighting for years to not be called prostitutes, to not be disrespected for the fact that they were victimized in the most brutal and terrible ways. But in talking about this with the sponsors, we realized, I, I said, we can't just do this because it becomes a Chinese, Japanese, Korean only problem. It, it, it remains niche uh, with the Asian community. And actually, this is a problem that is contemporaneously very, very important if we look at what Islamic State is doing in the Middle East 
um, if you look at situations that have arisen in the, in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, where um, the issue of war and genocide rape and post-war and genocide rape is huge and impacts on everybody in the society. That, so the fundamental thing was we had to involve artists from as many cultures as possible and to hear their voices, their specific responses um, because it is an international dilemma. So that was the first criterion, actually. You were speaking about this and I was thinking in, in our situation in the uh, um, 19th century. The many women from uh, the northern province of Corrientes, uh, the high society women were taken, were kidnapped and taken to Paraguay to be prostituted by the uh, hierarchy of that dictatorship in Paraguay. So then when they came back, they would close themselves in the house and they wouldn't want to see anybody. This was a terrible shame. So now we're starting to learn about that situation that happened a century ago. And, um, and this is the idea, I mean, that I think that's so important that not to be ashamed, as you say, yes. about this happened to you by, by chance, no? Mm -hmm. Again, also the, the, the feeling of cowardice, because there, is, there must be this sense of why didn't you defend yourself? Why didn't you do something about it? And I suppose it's impossible, they're broken. I, I brought, we don't, we don't have it here, do we? There is a book that just came out, that recently came out, of Gabriela uh, Cabezón Camara, and it's a story of a woman who has been, because we have this problem again all over, all over the world probably, of, um, of um, uh, human, human trafficking. So there are women at this very moment yes, being kidnapped to be Everywhere. taken to yes. brothels. So this is a story of a very, very interesting, we've written in a, in a, as, as a free verse uh, story. Of a, of a young woman who's been taken into a brothel, and the way they mistreat them, they, they break them to no extent, yes. so then you cannot protest, and that yes. she does defend herself and, and comes out of it. But they, they did it as, as, a, as a comic book. So it is interesting. And I, and I see Heidi Hattery here also, and she called also for all these um, uh, stories about women being brutalized or, or, or really mistreated, and she made them. Um, uh, sculptures in pigskin of these faces of these women and the different short stories and wrote a book and published a book called Heads and Tails. And the, this one is very interesting, it's fascinating because you, you are able to read this terrible, terrible mistreatment yeah. of women and very realistic because it has uh, all these drawings and this presentation yes. as a comic book in, in free verse also. Yeah. Uh, so, so all this has happened. These things are going on. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, as you say, they might not be so well noticed, but they, they are happening. And they, they start moving around and and being uh, exactly. And, and you have to to think as well that if you have that notion of of victimhood, if if people feel, oh, I have been broken, then then obviously that's going to be a very effective strategy. If, if you're trying to destroy people. Whereas if you have people saying, well, I'm not, I'm not broken, you're the broken one, maybe it'll be less effective as a strategy. I don't know, I mean, it's one way of looking at it. Yeah, I mean, this is, oh, um, yeah, just a, a quick aside. I, I just, on the way here, actually was reading in the New Yorker, there's um, a, a very interesting article about, um, in, in Iraq, you know where human trafficking is a huge problem right now, and it was it was an article that was sort of following this woman who had been um, she had been pressed into prostitution, and her response she, she she escaped from it, and her response now is that she and her husband go and they in this kind of very clandestine undercover way are trying to to you know because because she has all these contacts in the in that world and and to, to try to get women out of there and and get them into safe houses, and it's it's a it's an inspiring and heartbreaking article because it also talks about how you know the official structures are completely useless. You you know, and you know, so you you have to have these, you know, kind of just individuals. But but again, a woman who was refused to be broken by the situation. Anita, would you like to add anything before we pass over to the respondents? Um, well, I would like to just maybe s um, attempt to sum what was a 
trying to be addressed here, which is, I suppose, putting forward the question of the effectiveness of using art or the role of the art with um, not only as activism, but perhaps um, catalyzing people's awareness of what's happening in the world. And I, and I think that in different ways we've been attempting to answer this and um, really great to listen to everybody on the panel. I want to thank you all. And I would love to open this up to the respondents and then to um, everybody else in the audience, because I'm sure there's a lot of questions about this. And it's a discussion that's really, in a way, just begun. But we're limited with time, and it's a huge, it's a huge issue. So um, we'll, we'll let you start, Raul. I guess I'll stay here then. Um, anyway, I, I, get, I think it was clarified that Fiona was the curator and as well as Juan. That might have been some uh, confusion in the beginning. Um, but anyway, this is an exhibition that I was both envious and very proud. Envious because it's a very strong and powerful show. Um, and also very proud because I'm on the advisory board of White Box. And these are kind of exhibitions that with the defunding of important alternative quote unquote spaces like White Box, the problem is that there's a propensity to sort of homogenize um, art out there. And so it's very crucial for institutions like the White Box to, um, to be around and to continue their work. However, my first question, Marjorie, can we go back to the um, Teresa Margoy's photograph? Can we seize that image? Is that possible? All right. Well, anyway. Um, I, was, uh, I, I found that image to be probably one of the most arresting and uncomfortable um, works in the exhibition. And I was um, thinking about Susan Tontag's um, text regarding the pain of others on how that image, which I'll give you some context, is an anonymous photograph from the 70s that Teresa Margoyes received. And it's a photograph of um, a sort of strip show in Ciudad Juarez in the 1970s, and so you see the woman sprayed out on her stomach, and basically she offers sex acts to anybody who wants to sort of come on stage. And so my question is, how do you resolve um, questions about the pornography of violence or imagery of that sort, considering Sontag's text, and as well of like, let's say, uh, a perception of that image, a la like, let's say, Andrea Dworkin or Catherine McKinnon that see that as like, untouchable? Well, I think one of the first things that had to be considered in curating the exhibition, and you have pointed out this very disturbing image, but I would say that it is one of the very few images in the exhibition that, that engenders that kind of response. And the way it has been, yes, and the way it has been curated, uh, I was very aware of the fact that we wanted people to be able to come and see the exhibition and not to be completely horrified by it. If, if you have people coming in the door so shocked by what they see, they're going to go away, they're not going to engage with the issue. It was very carefully displayed. It was in the lower floor where actually if you were somebody who was going to be very disturbed by this particular image, you wouldn't be exposed to it straight off. You were led down to it, and you could always turn your back if it became too difficult, yeah? And I think this is actually very important, that that, that was in place. The rest of the images in the exhibition tend to be ones that are, the meaning, the meaning of it and the way it addressed the issue was actually much more subtle. You know, so by the time you got to that particular image, it, it did have that absolute shocking effect, but it wasn't fetishized. Um, you know, there's no glamorization of violence in the exhibition, because I think that would be a double victimhood to go through for anybody who has been a victim of sexual violence. Um, so, so those were all considerations, but sometimes you cannot draw back from using a particular image, because it is, it is in the right place, and it is also one of the things that Teresa spoke about with that image. The thing that's most disturbing is not the woman on the ground who's naked, it's the fact that you're looking at all the American guys sitting down watching her as if she is an animal, and, and you cannot help but look at them and their faces and be disturbed by that aspect of it. So, so I hope I've answered your question. 
Thank you. Is anybody else would like to respond to that? Yes. I have a question here for everybody, not only for you. Is pornography in the eye of the beholder? Yes. Well, oh, I keep doing the wrong one. Yeah, they say eroticism is what I like. Pornography is what you like. So my question is about the human aesthetics across cultures and of course also across history. Uh, when you see uh, a Muslim going to Mecca and sees the house of God the first time, there are tears. And when the crusaders got the uh, holy places back from Muslims uh, in Jerusalem, they were also crying like babies. Throughout human history, identity has been a crucial factor. And there is a tendency to look at the product of art rather than the processes of perception and the reader and the developmental stages of the reader. Across the board, curriculum is highly political. And children learn certain things very early on which becomes part of their aesthetic response. So where, is, where are the households, where are the textbooks, where are the discourses uh, which have to be there if human education is to be informed by human rights and planetary consciousness? And, and world art, are, do you aware, are you aware of any curriculum which is informed by human rights very early on, especially in the world of art? Well, I'm not, actually. I don't know anywhere you can go and learn these things, and you have to learn by experience. And I would say that uh, an interesting point about the curation of this particular exhibition is that it, when I came to, to the project, Juan came on board as the local co-curator. And one of the things that we were very clear about is we had to have an approach that embraced the international aspect of art, but the local aspect of art as well. And so when this exhibition leaves, it's, it's next going to Beijing. It opens in Beijing on the 25th of October. It's actually going to be a different exhibition because some of the artists will remain, but there will be many Chinese artists and uh, artists who are non-Chinese but resident in, in Beijing who will join the exhibition. And actually, it will have a different feel to it because it's evolving in, and it's going to involve the local aesthetic as well. And I think that's terribly important. I think you can't just kind of globalize things and send things all over the world and expect the response to be the same. Yeah. And we will be recurating this exhibition with different local co-curators everywhere the exhibition goes. So I don't know if that kind no, of... I, I, is that, keeping yeah? Thank you. Does anybody else want to say something? Yes. I have my own microphone, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, I will have a comment to that. Um, the capitalist Anglo-Saxon communities um, have made um, erotics be pornography, right? We grew up in other places, Catholics and other places around the world. The erotics were very, very important. If you go to Paris, for example, I remember entering the La Gare de Lyon, and there was a huge, enormous billboard with a naked woman in a little gold watch. Did you look at the watch or the woman? It was just beautiful and simple. Men, too, we had them with underwear now. Yeah? And so I think this um, particular um, Protestant community yeah, um, shies away from what we, be, we call lovely, organic, erotic, and even in advertising, everything has this subliminal taste of the forbidden, the dirty, the nasty, the nighttime, yeah, s and M. Oh, it's most of the advertising we see. But anyhow, that was just a little comment. Sorry. Um, I think, Anita, um, one can make art about any subject, and places like White Box will show it regardless of the consequences, yeah? other than with a little bit of funding. And my question will be um, to all the panelists now, very simple. Um, running a very small place, and I'm extremely touched, Marjorie, Anita, all of you really flying from all over the world, to come to the Sackler Center for Feminist Art, the temple. Yeah, uh, Brooklyn Museum, one of the most, most fabulous uh, favorite uh, museums in America. We're here, these little guys, uh, white box. 
with small budget, with our friends from Taiwan, with a show that really is exquisite, powerful, uh, has been very well attended, and has not been very well covered. So in small places like that, we face, um, I would say, three um, viruses. And um, then, then comes the question, are very simple. Lack of proper press coverage means affects our funding. Goodbye. The real estate markets have changed since we moved here eight years ago, and they're doubling up right now as we speak. We're going into litigation. Three, academic stops. Um, every 10 um, tours that artists who are teachers at SVA, at all the schools that walk by will skip white box in favor of a very bright show next door and a very bright show before next door or across the street. Now in a two out of 10, I count them, I clock. So we have three uh, viruses to contend with. I'm not complaining, I'm only stating. So my question to you on the panel, and I know you come from alternative spaces early on, et cetera, right, as the place uh, to go, is, and in 1983, uh, I read Ed Koch predicted the day when nonprofits would exist any longer in Manhattan, 1983, because of the real estate going up so high and nobody taking care of the bottom line, supporting, like in Europe or in Latin America and other places around the world, the bottom line of small independent artist run spaces that we are at White Box, right? So, to all of you, it's only one question. Are this kind of a small little elephant, uh, white elephant, like white box, alternative, not-for-profit art spaces, necessary today to exist, to remain in Manhattan, or have we seen the best of our days and we should back up and go to Industry City, uh, Dumbo, and lower our pants to the real estate um, bosses? <laughs> well, I think you just have to do what you have to do, um, and you're right. I mean, the the you know, the I mean, a lot of the the market, um, the real estate, um, all these things. And, and as I was saying before, even with the um, you know the, the the change in the ownership of uh, various art magazines, all of these things sort of conspire, I think, in a way. But what they say to me really is that we need to come up with some you know, maybe some new systems for this whole thing. I mean, it, it's, yeah, what, what's, what we have right now doesn't seem to be working. Um, and I think it's very important, obviously, to have places like White Box, places where you can do shows like this, you know, where you're not worried about sort of commercial things or even, I'm sure you probably couldn't do this at a, a university either. It would be difficult because of the nature of the subject matter. I mean, I don't know if you you looked into that, but, you know, sometimes there are constraints there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, we, you know, the system's kind of broken right now. I mean, I think that's true. I mean, that's kind of a whole nother discussion, but, um, yeah, I think things are, we, we need this kind of thing and we need to figure out a way for there to be this kind of thing. I'm sure, in, how do you see this little panorama since you uh, grew up in some of the alternatives in 1983? I saw a beautiful piece of you across the street from White Box with uh, Ai Weiwei as painters. You know, uh, Ace Gallery. How is it today to you? This well, I, I can only speak for myself, um, and I believe in the power of com community. I work with a small community. I function in that realm, which is why I'm here tonight because I believe in White Box for what it is, and so um, I think there is an importance. But I think it is up to the constituency to recognize its importance and it's not really just the media or it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a chain of uh, and, you know sources that have to support you but I think most of all it comes from individual and I whether you are in fact I know in the art world I'm always at a loss how little dialogue there is between the artists you, you only see them in the openings um, and the reason a lot of artists teach is because they, they really envy that discourse. And I know many artists that I've encountered throughout visiting critics that I've done, where they, they obviously make much more money in, in the art world than teaching, 
But the only reason they do it is because they lack that sense of community, that sense of discourse, um, where you are able to speak with a young person about ideas, about importance of art, about arguments that you wouldn't have in the art world today. So, but I go back to that the origin of all that comes from the individual interest. In my part, I'm deeply interested in underground and community-based. That's why I moved to cinema, because it's all about the community, uh, people coming together and working. So uh, again, I only offered you my own personal observation. It doesn't help very much. Well, I think thank you to all the panelists and to the respondents. And I would like to now open up the subject to the floor and ask you uh, if you have got any questions, please do ask. And we've now got a mic, so you don't have to come and stand up here if you don't want. Has anybody got a question? It's unbelievable. Gosh, did we cover the subject that well? Yes, at the back. And to me, that's the point. My question is, why do we still walk in and feel shocked? It's because we're uninformed that we are shocked at these images. And I'm grateful for the documentation. Earlier, uh, someone said that even universities won't accept uh, pieces like this. When Motero wanted to um, show Abu Ghraib, no one would take it. So he had to show it in his own studio until um, the Katzen Center in Washington, D.C. took his work, and it was the only place it was shown. And so... Yes, I, I, I would have to argue with you about the interpretation of pornographic, because actually it, it is about... It's like looking at a film that's dealing with the subject of racism and calling it racist. I think there is a difference, yeah? And I think Teresa Margoyes presents her image, which is about pornography. It is not pornographic, right. yeah? And I think this is a crucial difference. What I meant was what happened to these human beings yes. was pornographic. Yes, yes, absolutely. It was violent. Yes. And when you take away the subtlety and the nuance, yes. you're left with what happened to human beings. Absolutely. So we should be shocked. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. You, you are right. I know, but at the same time, at the same time, you want a lot of people. To, you don't want people coming and saying, "I just can't look at this." It's you know, I've spent I've spent three years yeah. doing an awful lot of reading and research about the subject, and I have lain awake at night, and it has had a it has been a huge burden for me personally to carry, to have to deal with this. Um, so it's not easy, and I don't really want people coming in to the exhibition and for example, censoring their children, not allowing their children to see it, and, and just going away, not able to, you, you have to, it, it is a fine line, it, it, because you're not compromising on the meaning front, but you do have to respect the fact that, you know, if you want people to engage with the subject, you've got to draw them in. You've got to draw them in, and be kind, perhaps, in, in, in showing them. I, would, I wouldn't wish anybody the reading material that I've been reading, oh. you know. I just wouldn't wish it on anybody. And yet we should know about it. And yet we have to know about it. Well, our job is to bear witness, actually. I believe that's a huge Yeah. I want to thank the young gun and Juan Putes for actually putting this whole thing together. Um, it's, and I want to thank the panel. The panel was terrific today. And on behalf of the Sackler Center, thank you all for coming. And I think it's a wonderful thing to be doing these kind of talks and with this kind of subject matter. I think it's a very important issue to let everybody know what's going on in the world and um, for here for tonight. So thank you all and I so appreciate this great turnout. Thank you.